Welcome to everyone who's joined us today. Thank you for joining us. And um, I'm Catherine Bell, the editor in chief of Quartz, and I'm delighted to welcome a fantastic panel. We are going to be here to talk about um, how to do what that video suggested, which is to take on this challenge of the recovery from these twin crises, the health crisis and the economic crisis that the whole the whole world is facing in order to make a global economy and a future of work that's fairer and more inclusive. So in this session today, it's a quick session, so um, we'll be just scratching the surface, but our main goal is to really focus about uh, on which priorities we should be focusing on and, and setting some of those priorities. So I'll start by introducing our speakers. Today we have Joanne Jenkins, who is the CEO of AARP. We have Alex, Alex Liu, Chairman and Managing Partner of Kearney. Caroline Casey, who you saw in that video, Founder and Director of Valuable 500 in Ireland. Anne Birgit Albertson, CEO of Plan International. Maya Roy, CEO of YWC Canada. And finally, Edward Ndopu, the UN Secretary General's Sustainable Development Goals Advocate. So I'd like to start with a bit of a speed round and ask each of our panelists the same question. What do you see as the top priority, top priority to address in order to pave the way for a more equitable and inclusive economy? So please keep your answer to just a sentence and Joanne, we'll start with you. Well, good morning. I think that one of the most important things is for us to really focus on, as you said, that health equality as well as uh, financial uh, equality. And I think that's going to make sure that all of us, regardless of where we live and in our, in our income levels, that we have an equal opportunity to not only find work and make a living, but also have access to quality health care. Absolutely. That's something we've been talking a lot about in our newsroom that health that health equality is required for financial equality. Alex, let's go to you next. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Catherine. My, my perspective is that leadership needs to actively intervene to create an environment where the workforce feels safe, seen, supported, and actually inspired by what they see unfolding from leadership. Caroline. The best background of the day. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> of course. So for me, is I really believe we need to dismantle the very siloed uh, approach to inclusion that is very destructive and coercive. We need to implicitly build an understanding of our interconnectedness as human beings right across the planet, across society, across industry. And I passionately believe as we move into this transformation stage we equally use our heads and our hearts our humanity and our data they need to be in equal measure and Birgit what's your top priority so I deeply believe that um, every girl child uh, from birth um, into young adulthood needs to feel uh, equally um, heard, uh, seen and valued um, as a precondition for taking active part in the labor force. And that at the other end of the spectrum, every person in a position of power in her life, whether as a baby or as a young adult or employee, needs to deeply understand their own power, privilege, and unconscious bias to rid the world of uh, the type of inequality that we see today. Thank you. Maya? Good morning. Good morning, Catherine. Um, for, I think as leaders right now, we're all being tested. Um, and certainly the decisions we're making today are going to be studied for, for generations to come. For us at YWCA Canada, 
It's about centering those who are experiencing the most oppression, the most vulnerable, the most marginalized community members, i.e. low-income women, people of color, looking at the impacts of the crisis on them and really using the disaggregated data to drive evidence-based policymaking. So for us, that's our priority. Edward, let's wrap up this speed round with you. Sure, so I think it's absolutely important that we reimagine the public policy process and ensure that we reach um, those furthest behind the line of opportunity and really center their lived experience in the way that we think about public policy. It's really interesting how so many of you have um, sort of looked at ways to include everybody in some cases, starting with one community and moving towards everybody. Um, and, and often that being the, the people who are most vulnerable right now. There's a lot to say about that. So moving on, I'd like to start again with Joanne. Um, so this year, especially in the US, um, but around the world, many companies have publicly committed or recommitted to diversifying their workforces and talent pipelines and, and improving inclusion. Um, and AARP established a program to support companies in making their workplaces more inclusive of older workers. Can you talk about what has been most effective about that program to help companies actually um, live up to those promises that they made? Sure. So I think one of the things that we've been pushing, obviously, is, uh, is age inclusion into uh, the work that we're doing around disparities. And so we have what's called the AARP Employer Pledge where companies in the US uh, and actually uh, multinational countries around the world will sign the AARP pledge that says they're not going to discriminate against people because of their age. We have over a thousand companies who signed that pledge. And as part of that, uh, they commit to uh, a recruitment process that includes age, uh, age diversity. Uh, and I think what COVID has brought to the front, uh, forefront is particularly with people working at home, that it's a lot easier for older people to do the work when it doesn't include that commuting and sort of going back and forth. Uh, and I'm, I'm just so excited that uh, all of these over a thousand companies has signed up to be a part of uh, this campaign that shows the value of older worker and what they bring to the workforce. Uh, and particularly at a time when we're gonna need so many more people to do the work, particularly in the healthcare areas uh, and in uh, education where we see so many uh, school systems around the country struggling to do virtual learning and not having enough teachers. And so uh, this uh, AARP employer pledge has really been at the forefront of what we're trying to do at AARP to bring attention to the fact that age diversity also ought to be included in some of the pledges that companies are, are taking uh, to address equity inclusion and the social justice issues in the US. That's great, thank you. Uh, the, so I'd like to turn to Alex and stick on that same question about, about how work has transformed so suddenly in many cases, um, wh where work can be remote in many cases, it has suddenly become remote, at least temporarily. And so I'd like to talk about the challenges and opportunities for diversity um, and inclusion that that presents. Um, what can you tell us about what you've learned about how organizations can not only help their employees adapt to that new way of working, but take adm advantage of the moment of extreme change to improve diversity and inclusion? Right, no thanks. And I think there's a, a huge mental aspect to the sense of belonging and engagement and true inclusion. I think we can all agree that even before COVID, there was an absence of things that were going right. Not enough justice, not enough equity, not enough fairness, not enough joy. And I think what the current environment has ex accentuated, of course, is inequities and in people that don't have computers and can't virtually work, et cetera. But the fundamentals are the same, which is people now, especially since, since things are so visibly raw, how do you get people to stay connected? Most diversity is actually hidden, right? 90% of it is, uh, is uh, in your brain. It's how you're coping with mental stress, anxiety, 
There was an epidemic of that in isolation even before, uh, even before COVID. What I've seen work is using technology to help connect people. Uh, for example, in the racial justice uh, movement in the United States, which is long, you know, long, long uh, overdue, you know, we had our colleagues in South Africa communicate and be allies to mm -hmm. our folks in the United States to be able to say, how do you go from reconciliation reckoning from a very bad place? Um, we've opened up and I've seen many companies make it more possible to have courageous conversations. We have a program called This Is Me. This is about mental health, but it could apply to any underrepresented or outsider group to talk about the stories that got to where they are. What is their belief system? What have they experienced? And it opens up the emotional allyship that people need to have in order to feel solidarity and feel included. The other thing is we have to, you have to actually, and you can use technology for this too, Captain, which is ask people, do they feel like there is change and progress? Do they feel included? And you can actually talk about it in your smaller groups within the company or whatever community you're talking about. So honest conversations, allyship, leadership commitment behind all the programs that people need and the pledges that support that in coming from the top. And of course, leaders need to speak too, tell their story. Thank you. Yeah, there, there are two points you made there that I think are so important and often not made. One is that, um, that so much of diversity is invisible and um, people forget that obviously. And also I'm so glad you mentioned joy because so often these conversations end with um, a sort of basic level of fairness, which is not enough. And, joy is a right and um, it should be ultimately part of what we're working toward. So Caroline, many of the companies we're talking about who've committed to improving diversity and inclusion this year have not made a lot of progress since those um, commitments were made and living, living up to um, what they said they would do. Um, and obviously it's difficult to do that. How can stakeholders both inside the organization and outside the organization work together to give companies incentives to change and support in those changes? Well, firstly, can I just say, Joy, yes, Alex, <laughs> hence the, the wallpaper. But I'd say that because it's really important about the openness and the humanity that you as a leader have just expressed. So I want to start with Leaders make choices and those choices create culture. And we are being more human. This is more human. We are more vulnerable than we have ever been. The Valuable 500, just to explain where we have this great community to which we engage with, is the first and only global CEO community which is transforming disability inclusion through business leadership and opportunity. We now have 330 companies in this community and that was in 19 months. And what is really different and how we can change this, it's because it's leaders like Alex who gave his personal commitment to support the integration and the journey for inclusion throughout that business. And combining the power of the leadership support and accountability at board level to ensure that the activities or the energy or the ideas or the curiosity or the innovation throughout business is being supported is what has been missing for so long. Leadership exists right throughout the organizations. And what we've seen with the Valuable 500 companies that we have is they have been so worried about not doing enough that it has been the barrier for them to try. They have been so concerned that they would never get it right, particularly around disability inclusion. And that's why disability has often been on the sidelines. And they have been so worried that some of the, the ideas or innovations that they would have used for other areas would not be viable. And so for me, I think as we move forward in this transformation, I really urge us to be vulnerable in saying, I don't know, but being accountable in how I can and we need the leadership to do that. Accountability, collaboration, and that vulnerability piece are essential for all of us and in community. And I believe as we move forward to do that together, we will innovate, learn from our mistakes, but do not cancel each other out because innovation will lead to failure. And if we handle failure well, we can learn and move on, but do not annihilate people, be allies for each other. 
Absolutely. So one thing we haven't talked much about is technology. And um, so I'd like to I'd like to turn to Anne Brigitte with a question about that. So as we introduce new technologies into education, which is happening in my apartment and <laughs> in many other places um, and into the workplace, how can we ensure that the technology increases equality and inclusion rather than reinforcing existing inequities, which it's doing a lot of right now? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, there is no doubt, of course, that technology and particularly access to the internet um, is absolutely crucial in this particular moment, but also in the future and for the future of work. But let me just give a few pieces of data in terms of the, the digital gender gap. So globally, um, only about half of the world's population are actually on the internet. Coupled with that, globally, the internet gender gap is 11, almost 12%. Um, and in least developed countries, it's 31%. So you've got a whopping big part of the global uh, population that don't even have access to the internet still. And we talk about it as such a reality for all of us. And on top of that, if you then uh, look at figures like girls are five times less likely to consider a career in tech than boys, then we're seeing um, the technology sector, largely male dominated, um, driving uh, solutions that are male dominated and may have imbued um, unconscious biases in them. And we know for a fact that that is the case. And you've got young women who are then relegated to, um, to low growth sectors um, in agriculture and garment industry, other places that are likely to be uh, see job replacement by, by automation. So there's a huge gender gap all across the, the, the work environment. Um, why is that? Just briefly, I talked a little bit about it before. I mean, the, our, our societies have inbaked structural um, injustice baked into it. You have all talked about it, uh, gender norms, harmful uh, practices, etc. make uh, girls incredibly uh, vulnerable. Um, in so many parts of the, the world, uh, leadership is depicted as male, science is depicted as male, technology is depicted as something that only men should be interested in. We have to rid the world of that kind of imagery to make sure that we move forward. And, and then just finally, I wanted to just um, say that we have seen here in this COVID-19 era, a lot more girls and young women get onto the internet which is phenomenal. But what we've also seen, and, and my organization, Plan International, has just done the first global study of this, 14,000 young girls were asked across 31 countries. We've also asked them about um, online um, harassment. And it turns out that over 60% of girls and young women that are online, 60%, have experienced online um, sexual harassment and harassment, uh, cyber stalking, pornographic photos being uh, put to them, but also very distressing forms of abuse, of threats, of violence and rape and other things. Um, we have to make the space where girls and young women uh, will have their first interaction with technology. We have to make that safe as a first port of call for technology, even to reach um, the, the, the technology to be an attractive uh, space for girls to, to be in. Thanks. That is truly horrifying. <laughs> um, so um, speaking of different communities, we've had some different specific communities brought up in this call so far. And, and they have very different experiences of inequality and just injustice in the workplace and different needs. Um, but the scale of change that's necessary requires many of um, the um, organizations working with those communities to work together in all different kinds of coalitions. So Maya, I'd like to ask what you've learned through your work at the at YWCA in Canada about the role that community networks can play in, in, in enabling that collaboration. 
Thank you, Catherine. That's a really good question. When it comes to community networks, it's a very interesting way to prototype innovative solutions. Um, YWCA Canada, we have 34 shelters for women across Canada leaving abusive relationships and 2000 units of affordable housing. And during when lockdown first started um, at a time when cash flow was very tight for businesses, when charities were laying workers off, um, we were able to partner with companies like Uber. Um, and Uber, for example, donated free in-kind rides and meals um, so that women could leave their homes and escape an abusive relationship. Um, so there's some interesting ways uh, to partner. I think it's also very important as leaders to acknowledge what we don't know. Uh, for example, we're a charity. We're, we're not a supply uh chain company. So we actually partnered with a humanitarian organization, uh, Federal Express, um, and uh, a local craft brewery, a beer brewery, who had actually switched production to hospital uh, grade hand sanitizer. Um, and with Federal Express and Global Medic actually shipped in kind uh, hundreds of gallons of hand sanitizer to the Arctic in, in Canada and right to every shelter uh, across Canada. So this was during uh, PPE shortages uh, across Canada before we started domestic production. So it's really interesting when NGOs, companies and vulnerable community members who with that lived experience um, identify solutions, we can actually put our heads together um, and come up with some really interesting change. So it's certainly in Invite everybody on this call to get in touch with myself or Nerissa Naidu. Uh, there's a number of young global leaders who are actually uh, prototyping and field testing these solutions. So absolutely, it's very challenging. Sometimes we don't know what to do. Uh, it can feel very overwhelming, especially in, in a global crisis. But there are opportunities out there to actually build back better. And especially in the case when uh, the United Nations is actually referring to the shadow pandemic um, right now. So uh, in lockdown, being in lockdown with your abuser uh, can be a death sentence for a woman and global rates yeah. of gender violence and domestic violence have actually increased anywhere between 20 to 40% across the world. Also horrifying. <laughs> um, so I, I want to take a big step back in just the last few minutes we have and talk to you, Edward, about the sustainable development goals. So all of the, the goals that we're talking about in individual organizations and, and for very specific communities all add up to those huge goals that we have as a, as a world community. So how can everybody on this call, everybody listening in, take part in ensuring that the current crisis we're in or set of crises accelerates progress towards those goals instead of slowing it down. Sure, thanks, Catherine. I hope my internet survives uh, because I've had a bit of a <laughs> um, But what I really wanna say is I think we need to start with the recognition that um, crisis after crisis the same communities bear the worst manifestations. Mm -hmm. So when we speak about the climate crisis, when we speak about this global health crisis, when we speak about racial inequality, we're speaking about black and brown people in both the global north and the global south. We're speaking about indigenous people, we're speaking about disabled people, we're speaking about women. And of course, all of these communities embody a multiplicity of experiences simultaneously. So we need to be able to start operating in a decompartmentalized fashion. How do we think about public policy as something that actually is able to respond to intersectionality? We cannot separate gender from climate. We cannot separate climate from poverty. All of these global goals are interconnected. And of course, what sits above the SDGs is the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It's a comprehensive vision for people and for planet. So I think a profound recognition of the intersectionality, not just of people, but of issues, um, will go mm -hmm. a long way in, in, in helping us uh, meet uh, the SDGs. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a big point as well, I think is we need to start measuring uh, differently. 
Um, you know, just before COVID, people that converged from $1 a day to $3 a day, we counted that as progress. We said the world has made a dent on poverty. And now we see that these people are mm -hmm. unable to withstand the shocks of global crises, both the economic fallout of COVID, but also of COVID itself. How can we be more ambitious in what we measure and how can we count what is often Uh-oh, uh, Edward, I think, oh, we lost you for a second, but you're back. Uh, okay, I think we've lost you again, but I think I think we got that, the, the main point that we have to be truly ambitious. And I think we've we've seen that throughout this conversation. We need to be ambitious in, in, the, um, in the goals that we're reaching and the ways that we're trying to reach them and in, and, um, aiming for something higher for, for everybody in the world, including Joy. Um, I'm just checking, I think we have one minute. If, if somebody can answer, we have, we have a, a, a question from a listener and I'm gonna squeeze it in if somebody can answer this really fast. Um, so the, the question is, how do you prepare leaders to value the lived experiences and perspectives of those furthest from opportunity and work to shift power and decision-making? Anyone want to take that in the last minute we have? I think quite, oh. quite basically that's a very good question. I, I think really it's about empathy. Um, mm -hmm. Being empathetic and, and, you know, the Harvard Business Review has published some very good research talking about when women and people of color and people with disabilities name uh, inequities in their workplace, there's actually a career penalty. Mm -hmm. So I think empathy yeah. is key and clear policies and procedures. We know, unfortunately, anti-racism training doesn't work without very clear systems within your organization and clear measurable KPIs or key performance indicators for equity. That's a good answer, thank you. Um, so we are out of time. And I'd like to thank all of our panelists. That was a great um, discussion and a frustrating one in that I would like to have another hour right now. But there are many other great conversations to come in the day of the summit, the final day. So I urge everyone on this call to get ready for the next one and thank you for your time. <laughs>